it is my pleasure to introduce uh, two speakers today, uh, Dr. Celine Galvanion and uh, Dr. Sami uh, Barmada. Uh, and uh, the first speaker will be uh, Dr. Celine Galvanion and um, uh, she, who is an associate professor in the University of Co uh, Copenhagen. Dr. Celine uh, Gauvignon uh, was trained as a chemist at uh, the Rennes National School of Chemistry in France. And she moved to the University of uh, Waterloo, Canada to receive her master's degree. Uh, and after that, uh, she went back to France uh, for her PhD. Um, she did it in the Atomic um, Energy Commission, CEA, um, CECLE, where she uh, studied membrane proteins using solid state NMR. And um, uh, Dr. Galvanian, Galvanian uh, did two postdocs. Her first uh, postdoc was uh, with Professor Chris uh, Dobson at the University of uh, Cambridge, where she studied the mechanism of lipid induced aggregation of alpha C nucleon. And uh, in 2016, uh, she went to Germany for her second postdoc at the German Center of uh, Neurodegenerative Diseases uh, in Bonn in the group of Professor Donato Di Monte, where she studied different animals and cellular models of Parkinson's disease. Uh, her research aims at understanding the interplay between uh, lipid homeostasis and neurodegenerative diseases, such as Parkinson's disease, and uh, she uses um, a multidisciplinary approach, um, uh, which uh, spans over a wide area in biology and biophysics. Uh, welcome to the series, and uh, we are so excited to hear your talk. Uh, and it's your turn. Thank you. Thank you very much for this nice uh, introduction and for the invitation. I'm very uh, happy to be here and to present uh, to, to you some of our uh, recent uh, mixture of some of our published and more recent uh, data. So we are uh, interested in understanding um, the interaction between alpha synuclein and membrane, and in particular, how the lip lipid composition of membrane affect alpha synuclein membrane binding and uh, aggregation uh, propensity. So we let me yeah. So the uh, let me give you a bit of background on the disease before we we dig into the studies. So the Parkinson's disease is characterized by two main uh, pathological uh, hallmark. The first one is the loss of uh, dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra. And the second one is the uh, accumulation of uh, uh, protein inclusions called the uh, Lewy body, which is spread through the brain as the disease uh, uh, progress. So these uh, protein inclusion uh, called Lewy bodies are made of uh, different type of protein and lipids and uh, the main constituent is the protein uh, alpha synuclein. So as I mentioned, other um, species than protein can be found in those Lewy bodies, in particular um, uh, organelles. And you can see here um, a, an image of a, a Lewy body where you can uh, see some mitochondria indicated in uh, orange and uh, lysosome in, uh, in uh, blue. So the link between uh, Parkinson's disease and uh, lipid is not only uh, uh, the fact that we find the uh, lipid molecule in the Lewy body, but we also uh, know that the level of specific lipid are altered in association with Parkinson's disease. And such uh, changes in the le level of specific lipid uh, are associated with changes of um, uh, the level of uh, total oligomeric and pathological alpha synuclein in different models of the disease, whether it is animal or, uh, or model or in a patient derived sample. One particular uh, risk factor that is highly relevant uh, in order to understand the link of, uh, between lipids and uh, Parkinson's disease are mutation of the GBA uh, gene. And this is actually the most important risk factor for Parkinson's disease. So this gene, GBA, encodes the protein glucose reposidase, 
you can see here a structure of the protein. So this is a glycoprotein that is found in the lysosome and is responsible for the conversion of a glucosyl ceramide into ceramide and glucose. And as the, um, and usually mutation uh, of uh, this uh, GBA gene alter the function of GCAs and leads to the accumulation of uh, glucosyl ceramide. We actually recently uh, reviewed the, the, the level of uh, GCAs, lipid, and alpha synuclein in, a, in, in, um, in many uh, uh, different uh, human derived uh, sample. And we actually uh, listed that GBA mutation uh, first lead to the decrease in the activity and protein level of GCAs. And this is um, associated with the increase of a specific lipid level, such as glucosyl ceramide, glucosyl sphingosine, and some uh, gangliosine. And this change in the GCAs activity and protein level also lead to an increase in uh, uh, alpha synuclein uh, level. And in some model, in particular IPA derivative, we could actually uh, find correlation among the three. Uh, um, a partner, but it's not yet understood the molecular uh, uh, mechanism by which each of those partners uh, are uh, in interconnected. And this is what we want to understand uh, further. So uh, alpha synuclein is um, an intrinsically disordered protein which can adopt an alpha helical fold upon binding to a uh, membrane. And this protein membrane interaction uh, is uh, found, uh, can, can play actually a role in the proposed function of the protein, which is to help uh, synaptic vesicles to, to fuse. However, this protein membrane interaction can also lead to uh, deleterious inter interaction and to the formation of toxic uh, aggregate and amyloid fibrils. So what we would like to understand is how uh, the lipid composition of a membrane dictate whether this protein membrane interaction will be functional or uh, deleterious. So I divided my talk in, in two main uh, parts. The first uh, uh, part is about uh, a work that we publish uh, and that will serve as a background for a more recent uh, study where we investigated changes in uh, lipid composition in a, a patient derived sample and how it, link, it is linked to uh, a change in alpha synuclein aggregation behavior. So let's start with uh, what we know about uh, alpha synuclein lipid induced uh, aggregation. So, for, for, for those of you who work with uh, alpha synuclein, uh, it is known that the protein doesn't form uh, amyloid fibril um, even for 100 uh, hours if the protein is incubating uh, on its own under quiescent condition at uh, neutral pH. However, if the protein is incubated in the presence of a specific type of lipid vesicle, not all of them, but in a specific type of lipid vesicles, the, the protein forms amyloid fibrils, as you can see uh, here. And this is the image of the amyloid fibrils that is formed by alpha synuclein when incubated with uh, DMPS uh, vesicles. So we wanted to understand a bit better the role of lipid in this process of amyloid fibril formation. So we measure the kinetics of alpha synuclein aggregation by varying uh, alpha synuclein concentration and the concentration of lipid vesicles. And we found that the rate of amyloid fibril formation was faster when we increased the concentration of protein. It was not really affected by increasing concentration of lipid, but actually the amount of fibril that, that was formed were increase with the amount of uh, lipid in uh, uh, solution. So we use kinetic analysis with the help of uh, Thomas Knowles in Cambridge, and we actually uh, found out that the role of uh, the, uh, the membrane was to provide a surface on which the primary nucleation can occur, and this step was followed by fibril uh, elongation. Then, as I mentioned in the introduction, we, we, we would like to understand uh, what can lead to the switch from uh, functional to toxic uh, alpha synuclein membrane interaction. So at this time, we use synthetic lipid. We made vesicle out of different type of uh, 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 synthetic lipid. So the property of those lipids were 
to have a negatively charged uh, polar head in order to have a, to have a proper binding with alpha synuclein. And we then vary the chain uh, properties. So we, we, we use lipid uh, with a chain length going from 12 to 18 uh, carbon. Uh, and we also vary the number of insaturation, which is this uh, double bond in the chain from zero to one. So we made vesicle out of those uh, five lipids and we incubated them with alpha synuclein. So under those conditions, all membrane except uh, DPPS membrane were in the free phase. And you can see here on this uh, binding curve that alpha synuclein bind in the same uh, way with the same uh, affinity uh, to all membrane in the free phase independently of the lipid that it's um, formed with. So the most important property to have an efficient binding between alpha synuclein and the membrane is the fact that the membrane needs to be in the free phase. If it is in the gel phase, as you can see here, the binding is not so, so strong. It's actually a very weak uh, binding. So the next step was to incubate alpha synuclein in the presence of uh, lipid vesicles uh, uh, in the free phase, so lipid vesicles that the protein bind to. And then we found that um, even though alpha synuclein bind to membrane in the free phase, it only aggregates in the presence of membrane made with short chain uh, phospholipid. And this is what you can see here. It doesn't aggregate, uh, although it binds to uh, POPS and DOPS membrane, it doesn't aggregate in the presence of those uh, longer chain, I would say, uh, lipid vesicle. So to summarize this part of the talk, what we propose is that the, the property that is actually important uh, for the lipid uh, in order to know whether it will uh, initiate or not the aggregation of uh, acinucleine, it is solubility. Because as you can see here, as you decrease the chain of your uh, phospholipid, you will increase its relative solubility. And therefore, they will be, uh, uh, and, and our results show that they actually are uh, better at triggering alpha synuclein aggregation compared to lipid with longer chain, which are less uh, soluble. And this result is in agreement with some, uh, or hypothesis is in agreement with some um, of the results of our collaborator in Lund, where this, uh, they show that gangliosides, which are um, lipid with a very uh, large uh, sugar uh, head, which are also relatively soluble, are pretty uh, good at, uh, at triggering or accelerating alpha synuclein uh, aggregation. So then we, we, we looked into the structural uh, uh, characterization uh, of alpha synuclein protofibrils formed with uh, lipids for two reasons, mainly because we could see that the structure uh, of the fibrid formed by alpha synuclein in the presence of lipid were, were, was actually quite different from what we observe for alpha synuclein uh, alone. And then the other reason why we look into this was because, as I mentioned before, the actual concentration of aminoid fibrils formed by alpha synuclein in the presence of lipid increased linearly with the concentration of, of lipids. We were wondering whether those lipids actually play a role not only in the uh, initiation of, uh, of the aggregation of alpha synuclein, but maybe in the whole process of uh, 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 self assembly. So here we use uh, solid state NMR and uh, DSC to look at the properties of potential lipid molecule in the fibrils. So the first uh, data that I'm showing uh, you here is the carbon solid state NMR spectrum of DMPS. The, basic, the lipid that we use to initiate alpha synuclein aggregation. And you can see on this uh, NMR spectrum that you have two sets of uh, peaks. Those peaks correspond to carbon in the chain, and those peaks correspond to carbon in the head. Then if you do the same measurement, but instead of using uh, pure DMPS, you put uh, alpha synuclein fibrils form in the presence of DMPS vesicle. Then you can also see that uh, the signal of the lipid is observed in the, in the fibril uh, uh, sample, showing uh, us that actually the lipid molecule co assemble with alpha synuclein into protofibrils. So this result shows us that the lipid not only play a role in the initiation of alpha synuclein aggregation, but they are also a reactant in the reaction of amyloid uh, fibril formation. So now I'm going to spend the last uh, part of this 
talk on a more recent uh, study where we investigated how GBA mutation uh, affect uh, uh, the lipid profile of uh, human fibroblast and how those lipid changes affect alpha synuclein aggregation propensity. So let me remind you the reason why we, we are particularly interested in the GBA mutation is because it's the most important risk factor for Parkinson's disease. And uh, this GBA mutation are associated with a decrease in the activity and the protein level of GCAs. And these changes are uh, associated with changes in lipid level and alpha synuclein levels in um, a range of patient derived uh, samples. So here we chose to work with fibroblasts and we look at fibroblasts from healthy control, from patients with Parkinson's disease and from patients with Parkinson's disease carrier of the GBA mutation L44P, which is supposed to be the most uh, severe. So we first look at the level of GCAs using Western blot and we look at GCAs activity. So we didn't find a really a, a difference in the level of GCAs in the three fibroblast population, but we found uh, that the mutation L44P GBA led to approximately 25% uh, decrease in GCAs uh, activity. Then we uh, extracted uh, lipids from those uh, fibroblasts and we uh, did a shotgun uh, lipidomic analysis. There we look at the level of a range of different lipids, including phospholipid, cholesterol, glyceride, and sphingolipid. And we mainly only observe a significant increase in the level of uh, sphingolipid. Then the next step of the analysis was, of course, to, lose, to look at the chain, because as I mentioned before, the, uh, the, the, the chain of the lipid uh, are very important in, um, uh, in determining whether or not a specific lipid can initiate the aggregation of alpha synuclein uh, or not. So we look at the main species of each of the sphingolipids that we detected. Here I'm showing you an example with sphingomyelin. And the main species that, that we could detect in our sample were sphingomyelin with 34 carbon here in the hydrocarbon chain and one in saturation. So this is this one. And the other uh, main species that we could detect was sphingomyelin 42,2, which means 42 carbon in total and two in saturation in the hydrocarbon chain. And what we, ob we observe is that the, in the fibroblast of uh, PD patients with the GBM mutation, the level of the short chain uh, sphingolipid here, sphingomyelin, were increased, whereas the level of the long chain sphingomyelin were decreased. And the same trend was observed for the other uh, sphingolipid that we could detect, which were ceramide and exosyl ceramide. So in all those, um, uh, for all those lipids, th this L44P GBA mutation led to a shift from the long chain to the short chain uh, sphingolipid. You can actually show this data in a slightly different way where you can uh, show the ratio short chain, long chain, and you can see that for the fibroblast of PD patient with GBA mutation, this ratio is increased for each of the three uh, main sphingolipids that we detected, smelin, ceramide, and exosyl ceramide. We could actually see that this ratio, short chain, uh, long chain, was inversely proportional to the level of GCA's uh, activity for each of the three uh, sphingolipids. So this is telling us that as you decrease the GCS activity level, the ratio short chain, long chain increase. So the next step was to uh, see whether or not this change in lipid profile associated with a GBA mutation has some effect on alpha synuclein aggregation. So what we did is that we isolate the lipids in the exact same way as we did for the shotgun uh, lipid analysis. We made vesicles out of those lipids. We incubate them with alpha synuclein and monitor the aggregation. So what we found is that uh, first uh, alpha synuclein was aggregating uh, faster in the presence of lipid isolated from PDGBA fibroblast compared to the aggregation of the protein in the presence of lipid isolated from control fibroblast. Then we, we took the fibrils at the plateau phase, we extracted the lipid and investigate the composition of the, those fibrils. 
And actually what we found out is that the, um, although initially we have uh, more uh, long chain uh, uh, sangolipid at the starting point, if you look at the fibrils, mainly the short chain sangomelin and the short chain exosyl ceramide were found in the fibrils, which suggests that the short chain uh, sangolipid co-assemble preferentially with alpha synuclein into uh, amyloid fibrils. So then one of the reviewers actually uh, uh, asked us uh, to prove that uh, this change in lipid profile was actually due to a change in GCS uh, activity. So what we did is that we treated the fibroblast with this small molecule uh, ambroxol, which is known to revert uh, uh, or to increase, if you wish, the activity of, um, uh, uh, let me, uh, I went too far, sorry, the, to increase the, uh, the level of uh, GCAs and its activity in different uh, models. This is mainly the work from Tony Shapira. So what we did is that we treated the, um, our control fibroblast and the PDGBA fibroblast with ambroxol. And as you can see here on the result of the, GC, the Western blot, the level of GCAs is significantly increased in both the control fibroblast and the PDGBA fibroblast. Then we also look at the activity of GCAs in the fibroblast from control and PDGBA. And you can see that uh, after treatment with Ambroxol, this A+, the activity is uh, uh, increased in both uh, control and PDGBA uh, fibroblast. Of course, I'm talking about uh, GCS uh, activity. Then we did the exact same uh, lipid analysis as we did for the untreated uh, fibroblast. And what we could see is that the treatment of the fibroblast with uh, uh, Ambroxol uh, uh, for the control and the PDGBA uh, fibroblast, uh, it uh, completely uh, abolished the difference in the uh, level of the sangolipid as well as the um, uh, ratio short chain long chain. We did the aggregation. We measured the aggregation of alpha synuclein in the presence of lipid isolated from the control fibroblast treated with ambroxol and PDGBA fibroblast control with ambroxol, and we could no longer see any difference in the aggregation propensity of alpha synuclein in the presence of those lipids. So this result told us that the treatment of the fibroblast with ambroxol reverts the lipid, the lipid changes that we observe, and also the pro-aggregation effect of lipid isolated from uh, PDGBA fibroblast. So to, to summarize this uh, last uh, study, so we, we, we found that the l 4 gba mutation, which is associated with a decrease in uh, activity of GCAs in the fibroblast, led to an increase in the sangolipid level, as well as a shift from long to short chain sangolipid. We also found that the lipids isolated from this uh, PDGBA fibroblast were uh, more efficient at uh, uh, triggering alpha synuclein uh, aggregation. And that the uh, and not only were they uh, more uh, efficient at triggering alpha synuclein aggregation, but the, they also co-assemble more preferentially with alpha synuclein into amyloid uh, fibrils. And we could find that the, this observation could be reversed by ambroxol treatment, where uh, which actually led to an increase in GCA protein and activity level, and uh, it reversed also the changes in uh, lipid profile as well as aggregation propensity of uh, alpha synuclein. So now I just would like to mention that we, uh, since um, two years ago, approximately, we uh, started to look into um, some um, neuronal model where we want to uh, continue this work that we started with the power blast. But this, this time we, we, we aim at uh, investigating changes in the lipid profile uh, associated with Parkinson's disease in two types of neurons, the dopaminergic neurons, which are a model of um, more vulnerable uh, cell type to Parkinson's disease and the glutamatergic neurons cortical, uh, the cortical glutamatergic neurons, sorry, that as a model of a less vulnerable uh, uh, neuron to uh, or cell type to Parkinson's disease. And this is mainly the work from Augustine and Sonia that, it, that are currently in, uh, in my group. <laughs>
So with this, I'd like to thank uh, the different people involved in this work. The biophysical work were mainly uh, done at the University of Cambridge and the University of Lund. And the more recent biological work was, was done in collaboration with uh, uh, Dino, the, the Donato Di Monte in Bonn, Tony Shapira and Fabio Blandini in UCL and in uh, Italy, respectively. And I thank also the, the different type of uh, funding that has been uh, used over the past uh, few years. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. It was really a great talk. I really in enjoyed it. And we already have questions on, uh, on the Q&A. Um, so you, you, do you prefer, I'll, I'll read them to you. Um, so uh, okay. there are two questions from Nabin. The first one says, most lipids have very low phase transition temperature, but how do you uh, induce phase uh, transition if the phase transition temperature is a very high? Let's say POPC is 18 to 16 uh, at 44 Celsius. So we so we actually used the um, the we we didn't use POPC we used POPS and uh, actually the melting temperature is uh, is uh, minus uh, something it's it's very low so we so the the melting temperature the melting that we observe is mainly for the um, uh, we could see a melting for the MPS uh, the PPS yeah mainly those those two type of uh, lipid because they had a, a melting temperature around. Uh, 41 for the first one and 60 for the for the other one. So on, under the condition that we used, the 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 membrane were were all in the um, uh, fluid phase because we work uh, above the their melting temperature, and uh, and and only for the PPS because we had to go above 60, which were too high for the experiment that we wanted to do. Then this one was in the gel phase. So, so the, the lipid with, uh, with uh, whom we, we work, I mean, the, the, we, yeah, uh, they were all in the uh, fluid phase when synuclein was, were, was bound to it. Yeah, thank you. So um, the second question from the B um, is also, uh, did you see any phase transition behavior of alpha synuclein before they bind to the vesicles or membrane? Uh, so I would say, uh, so, the, so we didn't see any uh, phase transition behavior of alpha synuclein because we run a DSC scan at the same uh, um, uh, um, concentration as the one that we use uh, for uh, in the presence of lipid. But what we observe is that the melting temperature of the lipid was affected by the presence of uh, alpha synuclein. So the, for example, the MPS, the, the melting temperature of the pure DMPS is around 40 degrees, but the melting temperature of the MPS when alpha synuclein is, is covering the vesicle is shifted to around 21, uh, 22 degrees. So the melting, uh, the temperature, uh, the melting temperature of the lipid, the lipid is affected by the binding of the alpha synuclein. But if you run alpha synuclein on its own in the DSC, you don't see any uh, phase uh, transition. Uh, thank you. Um, so the next question is coming uh, from um, uh, Mokhabat Jabat, uh, and the question is, did you reveal the mechanism by which uh, ve uh, vesicles affect alpha synuclein aggregation? Uh, so what, what what we found using a kinetic analysis is that um, the the lipid vesicles actually um, uh, initiate the the aggregation of alpha synuclein by uh, triggering its uh, primary uh, nucleation. But I think that now we need to re-evaluate uh, this um, uh, model, and actually that's some work that we've been doing with uh, Thomas Knowles in order to take into account the fact that the lipid are uh, uh, co-assembling with uh, alpha synuclein. So there is a more complex, uh, it's a more complex mechanism than just initiating the aggregation. It's actually, it's a co-assembly of a uh, lipid and uh, protein into amino acid. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the, the next question, it's from, from q and A's is um, uh, coming from um, Zaid uh, Hadi. Um, 
do you have any in, um, investigation about uh, the effects of different vesicles with um, different composition on the unfolding or different segments, including alpha C nuclein? So um, it, it's just whether you know which regions the, uh, I'm assuming uh, the lipids are binding to alpha C nuclein. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we don't really, uh, for this question, we don't really know, um, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know whether this is referring to the different uh, type of relics that uh, alpha synuclein can bind vesicles uh, to. Uh, at the moment in our model, we don't know whether um, this, uh, the, what we observe is for the short helix or the long uh, helix. But this is a very good uh, question. So we, we don't, it's an overall binding that we observe. We, we don't differentiate between the, the two type of, how uh, uh, many there is actually more than two type of uh, alpha helical uh, conformation that alpha synuclein can uh, bind the vesicle to. Yeah, we don't yet have this information. So that's a good question. Thank you. Um, uh, the next one is coming from um, Lisa McColong. Uh, um, what is known about the impact of GBA mutation on synuclein function? Um, what are your thoughts? Well, that is, that is a very good uh, question. So, so this is something that is not yet uh, understood and it actually, it is not clear uh, how uh, GBA mutation uh, affect alpha synuclein or how actually a decrease in GCS activity and protein level affect alpha synuclein and vice versa. So there is a, a, a loop between the, the two protein that Joe Mazzulli, I think, uh, or, or at least was part of the people who discovered the, this loop. And uh, so it's not even clear whether the GBA mutation are associated with or lead to alpha synuclein aggregation via a direct interaction between the protein or through the accumulation of uh, uh, lipid. So this is uh, something that we are currently investigating by uh, um, looking at uh, recombinant uh, GCAs and uh, alpha synuclein. So this is, this is not known. And uh, I, I suspect that uh, the alpha synuclein uh, have an effect on GBA, maybe by some uh, interact interaction between the two, uh, two proteins. Yeah, thank you. Um, the next question is coming from Frederica. Uh, did, you, um, did you find differences in the uh, GCIs, the protein levels uh, among IPD uh, and PD plus GBA fiber, uh, fibroblast compared to the control? No, we didn't find a significant in the protein uh, uh, level. And that's actually in agreement with some studies and in some stud uh, other studies, they found uh, differences. So this is uh, not yet uh, uh, evident why in some uh, in some fibroblast there is a uh, changes in the uh, level of uh, GCAs in PDGBA fibroblast compared to control and one in other and why in other we, we don't see it but in in all fibroblasts we didn't see it we didn't see a difference of, in the uh, GCAs protein level mm. and and then I follow with another question from Frederica it's kind of down this line since you're on the topic um, if so, uh, did you measure uh, GCS activity and normalize it over GCS protein level? This is actually also a really good point. We we so we didn't see any difference in uh, GCS uh, um, uh, protein level, so we we didn't have to uh, normalize to uh, the GCS activity uh, to the GCS protein level. But we do see a, a, a change in the GCS. Um, uh, protein uh, and activity in the IPS derived neuron that we are using uh, at the moment. And we are actually looking into this particular point to, to actually normalize the, the activity of GCAs uh, to the actual level of protein in those different cells. But this is a, a very good uh, point. Mm -hmm. um, the, next, the next question um, is from RDP135. Uh, is the increase in binding uh, propensity of alpha synuclein due to increased intrinsic curvature of short chain PS, uh, PS or is, is this due to increased diffusivity and coalescence about uh, the protein? And there is another question after following. Uh, 
What are your thoughts on why alpha-synuclein protein uh, prefers short uh, chain TS? So, so here for this one, um, for the first part of the question, sorry, the regarding the the the, the curvature, we tried different uh, size of vesicles, and we didn't see changes when we look at uh, in, in terms of the binding uh, and aggregation propensity. When we look at the vesicles from 20 nanometer to 100 nanometer uh, diameter, so we, we may need to go higher to see a change. But at least for the for the curvature that we uh, observe. So we didn't, uh, for different lipid in the treat phase, we didn't see uh, much difference uh, for this um, uh, size uh, range. And uh, regarding the second part, uh, why uh, a short chain uh, PS uh, are more, uh, have a better tendency maybe, we could say that, to initiate that fascinating aggregation, I think this is due to their solubility. So it's uh, thermodynamically probably more favorable to extract uh, short chain, uh, sango, um, not sango lipid, but PS uh, lipid to, so that they co-assemble uh, with alpha synuclein into fibrils than to do the, to do the same with the long chain uh, uh, PS uh, lipid. So this is uh, our hypothesis. And this is why we think that uh, uh, lipid with a relatively, um, relatively high, uh, higher uh, um, solubility uh, are more efficient at uh, triggering alpha synuclein aggregation. Yeah, thank you. That's, um, now, so the next question is uh, from Carmelo. Uh, and um, he's saying, just a curiosity, is it known that alpha synuclein from pores uh, in model membranes, um, uh, have you done a dye leakage measurement uh, to highlight these aspects? So, so, the, uh, so again, that's a good uh, that's a good question. We we know that actually the binding of the monomer disrupt the 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 membrane and can lead to some uh, leakage, and uh, and I think that if you incubate the protein the protein, the lipid vesicle sorry with uh, oligomers of alpha of alpha synuclein it also induce uh, a leakage of course to a larger uh, extent. Then uh, uh, we didn't investigate uh, the formation of pores by uh, alpha synuclein in uh, in detail, but that that's a very good uh, point that should be looked into. I think. Thank you. Um, and the next one is from Gunilla Westermark. And um, she says, nice talk. Is alpha synuclein always present on the membrane? Is it possible that alpha synuclein enters ER? This I don't know. So the alpha when we image our cells, we we don't only see uh, alpha synuclein in the on the membrane. So it, it's also in the uh, in the cytosol, whether it entered the ER, I, I don't know. This is something that we, I mean, we are looking into uh, organelle specific alpha synuclein membrane interaction, and we haven't yet looked into uh, the ER. But this is a this is a good point. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we we really in, enjoyed your talk, and I'm going to move to our um, next speaker uh, and. Uh, Celine, if you don't mind to stay for um, after uh, yes. he ends his talk, okay. because for like more uh, Q and A's, we have a discussion after that. So yeah, thank you for yes. so much for coming. All right, so um, yes, let me. Great. Um, it is my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Sami Barmada, who is uh, an associate professor in the Department of Neurology, University of, of Michigan. Uh, he, he's uh, my office neighbor, just a few doors uh, from my office. And um, I want to say that uh, Dr. Barmada received his uh, PhD in Washington University in St. Louis, uh, where he investigated uh, prion diseases with uh, Dr. David uh, Harris, and um, uh, his uh, postdoctoral studies he did with Dr. Steve uh, Finkbinder uh, at Gladstone Institute in San Francisco, where he established uh, faithful model systems uh, for the study of ALS and FTD pathogenesis. 
uh, including one of the first uh, human neuronal models of familial ALS in FTD. And in recognition of the impact and uh, promise of his original research, uh, Dr. Bermato was awarded the Young Physician Scientist Award from the American Society for Clinical Investigation in 2014. And he also received distinguished Angela Dobson and Lyndon Welch uh, Research uh, Professorship at the University of Michigan in 2015. Um, Dr. Bermato's research uh, takes advantage of a broad, broad uh, toolkit uh, of innovative uh, techniques and uh, methods uh, which involve um, fluorescence, microscopy, computer science, engineering, bioinformatics, genome engineering, and molecular uh, biology to investigate uh, molecular mechanisms in neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, and his work uh, uh, centers um, on um, critical abnormalities in RNA and protein metabolism in ALS and uh, FTD. Um, um, we have collaborated uh, on several uh, uh, projects and um, uh, Dr. Bermada continues to impress me with his wealth of knowledge uh, in molecular and cellular um, biology. Uh, welcome to the series. So glad to, uh, to uh, hear your talk today. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. And, and uh, I want to say thank you to the organizers. I'm, I'm really uh, happy to be here today telling you about uh, a couple different uh, stories that have uh, come together, really focusing on um, neurodegenerative diseases, ALS and frontotemporal dementia, autophagy, and, and cell type specific factors that regulate autophagy. Um, we um, tend to focus a lot on these conditions, these neurodegenerative diseases um, that uh, affect the elderly and typically um, display a, a range of symptoms, including but not limited to dementia. Almost all of these conditions show a single characteristic feature, and that's the accumulation of these misfolded or aggregate prone proteins. Um, but for the purpose of this talk, I'm really going to focus on these two conditions, frontotemporal dementia and ALS. And they are linked on several different levels. Um, one uh, characteristic that they share is the accumulation of a protein called TDP43. Um, but a, another factor that they share is their susceptibility to mutations that interrupt um, macroautophagy or, or autophagy. So we know that um, mutations that affect several different autophagy-related factors, including uh, P62, P97, ubiquitin-2, and TPK1, result in inherited ALS and FTD. And as I mentioned, both of these conditions show the accumulation of this protein TDP43, which is itself an autophagy substrate. So this raises two sort of fundamental questions. Uh, one of them is, uh, does impaired autophagy lead to TDP accumulation and neurodegeneration in ALS and FTD? And the second one is, is sort of the, the reverse of that. Can we turn on autophagy? and clear TDP and prevent neurodegeneration. And, and for the purposes, at least of today's talk, I'm gonna be focusing on this second question. And, and we had thought that to really answer this question, we needed a method that um, we could use to measure the turnover of proteins like TDP43 in living cells um, and in real time. And to do that, we took advantage of a photoconvertible protein called Dendro2. This is a green fluorescent protein, um, quite a bit dimmer than GFP, um, but when you shine a blue light on it, it irreversibly converts to a red fluorescent protein. And so we were able to um, utilize this information in developing a system to look at protein clearance in cells using light that we called optical pulse labeling. And I can go through sort of a, a layout of, of how we um, uh, adapted this. So, Typically, we'll use a, a fusion of TDP43 uh, of Dendra2 with our, our protein, in this case, TDP43. And then we express this in any cell type, in this case, primary neurons. Um, and then we pulse with a blue light, which converts a portion of that protein to red. And then we'll image it, and, and we turn the blue light off. So we're not making any more of that red protein. And then we image in the red and the green channels at regular intervals of time. <clears throat> 
And so this is what it looks like. You have a, a green, in this case, a neuron that's labeled in green, but the TP43 that's been photoconverted, it's usually a nuclear protein and we can see that red signal. But over time, as we're not making any more of it, we've pulsed with light. And so that protein is just degraded over time. And so we, if we're able to track the fluorescence intensity of that protein in each individual cell and calculate a half-life for the protein in each cell. And through several experiments, we're able to validate the use of this uh, platform and compare it to more traditional approaches like metabolic or radioactive pulse labeling. But importantly, we're also able to use this to demonstrate that we can induce the clearance of TDP43 using a series of tool compounds that we know enhance autophagy. So if we measure the half-life of TDP43 in um, over 100 primary neurons, in this case, you get a fairly broad distribution of half-lives. Um, each hash mark here is the measured half-life of TDP in a single neuron. Um, but when you add these compounds, including flufenazine, methotrimeprazine, and uh, 10-NCP, which as I mentioned, are all tool compounds that we know stimulate autophagy in neurons, we can um, enhance the turnover of TDP43. Um, these are really messy compounds. Many of you may recognize them as first-generation antipsychotics. Um, they, they do a lot of things. So we we, we took this as a positive sign that we can manipulate or, or induce TDP clearance, but we really wanted to find better means of stimulating autophagy. But that's easier said than done. Uh, autophagy is a, um, a dynamic pathway that can be tricky to assess in a quantitative fashion. And so this is a very concise outline of the pathway um, in which developing autophagosomes are uh, sort of decorated with this lipidated protein called LC3. Uh, the lipidated version is LC32. And as they mature, they encapsulate proteins and organelles in the cytosol. Um, and then upon fusion of the autophagosomes with lysosomes uh, and release of the lysosomal hydrolases, we get degradation of the contents, including LC32. Now, the problem is we typically measure the activity in this pathway by assessing these LC32 positive autophagosomes, right? Uh, and assuming that more autophagosomes are, are, are a sign of more autophagy. But because it's a dynamic pathway, if you block the degradation phase, the, the late stages of the pathway, you end up with a ton of uh, autophagosomes and you don't know whether that's enhanced autophagy or impaired autophagy. So uh, ideally, we'd have a, a method that's able to measure flux or activity through the entire pathway. And so we adapted that optical pulse labeling strategy that I mentioned for assessing autophagy flux by um, fusing Dendra 2 to LC3 in the case of macroautophagy um, or a um, substrate protein that has a particular amino acid sequence that is recognized by chaperone-mediated autophagy mechanisms. And then you pulse with blue light, you get red labeled protein, you can measure the degradation of the protein over time to give you an idea of pathway uh, activity for macroautophagy or chaperone mediated autophagy. For the purposes of today's talk, I'm really gonna focus only on this macroautophagy recorder. Um, and so I mentioned when you photo convert and measure the degradation of the red channel, you get an idea of flux. The interesting thing with this uh, particular recorder is you can also, you know, this is a green protein at baseline, but if you photoconvert, you get a drop in the green signal. And as you measure the return of green fluorescence, you get an idea of induction or initiation. All right. So um, to really make this into an accurate reporter, we didn't simply want to overexpress it because uh, overexpression can itself modify protein turnover pathways. So we took advantage of CRISPR-Cas9 to knock in Dendra2 into the LC3 locus. Um, and we're able to verify that we do in fact get labeling of LC3 by immunoblotting and by sequencing. Um, importantly, it's photoconvertible, just as we mentioned. Um, we can use this after treatment with uh, powerful autophagy inducers like Torin, which is a um, mTOR inhibitor. We can see the formation of autophagosomes and track them in real time. And, we can see the same thing when we inhibit autophagy with a late stage uh, ATPase, um, vesicular ATPase inhibitor baflomycin. Now, uh, but the goal here was to use this to identify new compounds as strategies that induce 
autophagy. And so this is the way it, um, we utilize the system. So uh, these are uh, time-lapse videos of these Dendro 2 LC3 knock-in cells in which we'd pulse with blue light and measure the uh, rate of disappearance of that photo labeled or photo converted LC3. And you can see that when we add a strong inducer of autophagy like taurin, you reduce that half-life significantly. Um, and that is blocked by this late stage inhibitor, baflomycin. I mentioned we can also use the green channel. It's actually um, quite helpful to look at both channels um, when doing these experiments because um, here you can see a very prominent effect of torn one on enhancing the turnover of these labeled autophagosomes that again is fully blocked by baflomycin. Now importantly, we can use information acquired from both channels in a dose response assay and uh, calculate with high confidence um, the uh, EC50 and IC50 for any compound that we're interested in. As you can see here, um, using the two channels gives you very complementary information um, and is also pretty accurate. Uh, this was actually interesting to us because most people use these compounds at several orders of magnitude greater than that calculated IC50, but um, we don't really need to do that. So anyway, after establishing the validity of the system and, and um, you know, showing that we can use it to, to uh, accurately measure the activity of different autophagy modulating compounds. We uh, worked with the Michigan Drug Discovery Center and the Center for Chemical Genomics at University of Michigan to screen in total over uh, 30,000 compounds that, um, well, that may or may not show any activity in uh, uh, modulating autophagy. And I'll show you a selection of some of these results from the Selic Chem collection. These are uh, FDA and EMA proved compounds that have known mechanisms of action. And um, as you can see, we're able to identify several um, novel uh, compounds uh, with novel uh, uh, effects on autophagy, both um, inhibition of autophagy as well as those that stimulate autophagy. This is in a, a isolated uh, transform cell line, the, the hex cells. Um, so we wanted a, a little bit more disease relevance, and um, we'd like to do this in, in a stay with a human system if possible, because we think that there, there may be some uh, difference in the regulation of autophagy in different species. And so we um, were able to acquire some human-induced pluripotent stem cells through the Allen Institute that had GFP-labeled LC3. So this is not photoconvertible in this case. This is um, just green fluorescent protein. Um, and then we incorporated a system of induced differentiation that allows us to get robust formation of uh, neurons, in this case, forebrain-like or um, ventral motor neurons within about two weeks. Um, and then we looked at uh, the GFB-LC3 signal in these neurons, and uh, importantly, we're able to do a lot of the same dynamic studies, even if we can't look at um, turnover of LC3 um, in the same way. But we were able to see that some of the, several of the compounds that we identified in uh, the previous screening assays uh, showed um, similar autophagy modulating effects, either inhibition or stimulation in these uh, GFP-LC3 I neurons, and we're able to quantify their, their effects in uh, static as well as dynamic assays, right? So this, I think is really important because it gives us a, an idea of what compounds uh, that, that are effective in human neurons, but it doesn't tell us how they affect the uh, original goal here, which was to improve or uh, extend survival in neurons um, in different neurodegenerative disease models. And so to look at their effects in sort of a, a, a translational model, we use a system called automated microscopy, which allows us to track individual neurons over extended periods of time, and importantly, uh, uh, identify each individual cell and calculate its time of death and essentially run a sort of clinical trial in a dish. And we've been able to adapt this automated microscopy platform looking at several different uh, disease models in ALS and FTD um, involving several different disease-related genes. Um, but again, for these studies, we, we picked a couple of these models, um, including TDP43 because of its connection with 
ALS and FTD. Um, but also um, this one, ubiquitin 2, which as I mentioned in the beginning, um, mutations in ubiquitin 2 are associated with uh, ALS and FTD, and this is an autophagy related gene. All right, so what happens in these disease models? Um, so first of all, um, here's our negative control, GFP plus vehicle. When we overexpress TDP in the red, we get a significantly higher risk of death over 10 days of imaging in, in culture. And when we add a compound um, that came out of this screen um, uh, that effectively induces autophagy, in this case, um, uh, labeled NVP, we see a significant reduction in the risk of death for our TEP expressing neurons. Um, we're also able to show via a knockdown of this essential autophagy related gene um, that this rescue requires uh, autophagy in these cells. And um, so this is great in the TDP43 model system. What about another one? Because it, it you know, there's this idea that autophagy induction should be broadly neuroprotective, especially in neurodegenerative disease models. So in the ubiquitin 2 model, though, we saw something very different. So again, in this case, here's our negative control um, cells expressing an infrared fluorescent protein. Um, when we overexpress this mutant form of ubiquitin 2, um, we see a small increase in risk of death. Um, and this time, when we added a, a compound that induces autophagy, things get worse and, and not better. And, and we think that's because, it, and there's some good evidence here um, from Mervyn Montero's group, among others, that uh, pathogenic mutations in ubiquitin 2 actually cause a late stage impairment in autophagy. And so based on the mechanism, if we stimulate autophagy uh, in the setting of a late stage impairment, we may just be making things worse. And, and that's at least what we see with these um, uh, survival studies. All right, so just to summarize, whew, five minutes, <laughs> going quick. So just to summarize what I've talked about before, I mentioned the system of optical pulse labeling that allows measurements of, of autophagy flux in situ. Um, we use this system um, for designing a reporter of autophagy that allows us to discover new drugs and, and pathways affecting autophagy and, and also um, show that autophagy induction has mixed therapeutic benefits depending on the disease model and the mechanism uh, of disease in each case. Um, and so in the, the remaining two minutes, I will very quickly um, just outline a project a newer project that is currently uh, under review um, about cell type specific factors regulating autophagy. So we took advantage of these I, I, uh, stem cells that had GFP labeled LC3 to, to differentiate them into many cell types and independently look at the regulation of autophagy in these cell types. And, and I'll just show a very brief example here of uh, stem cells, I four brain, these are four brain like neurons as compared to motor neurons as compared to astrocytes. When we stimulate with uh, torin one, you see the, the formation of these large autophagosomes um, in every cell type, really except the eye neurons. And, and the same thing is true um, when we inhibit using baflomycin. For some reason, eye neurons tend to be fairly resistant. Um, and uh, I will cut to the chase and, and say that through uh, a series of um, studies at the transcriptome level, uh, again, looking at not just the abundance of RNA, but the stability of RNA in these cell types, we're able to identify cell type specific factors that, um, that regulate autophagy specifically in eye neurons and not in stem cells or in motor neurons, so forebrain-like neurons. Um, I would love to tell you about the details of these, um, but in, in recognition of the, the limited time that I have, I will summarize and say um, that the factor that we found to be uh, prominently highly expressed in, in eye neurons and not other cell types is a, a gene called myotubularin-related uh, protein 5. Um, it's a phospholipase. Um, when we knock it down 
we can see a stimulation of autophagy again selectively in eye neurons. And when we overexpress it, we can suppress autophagy. So it's both necessary and sufficient. Um, we're now working on uh, the pathway that regulates MTMR5 in these cells versus other cell types. And also whether or not selective modulation of autophagy in specific cell types is perhaps a more um, rational therapeutic plan that wouldn't be associated with as many drawbacks as a global autophagy activator. All right, and just to acknowledge the people who did the work, um, uh, Nate Safran uh, did the lion's share of the work on the uh, autophagy screening. Jason Chua is um, a person who did most of the work on the, uh, the MTMR5 story with Aaron Kin. Elizabeth Tank did a lot of the work in the IPSC differentiations. And I also would like to acknowledge my funding. And with that, I'm, I'm happy to take any uh, questions. Thank you, Sami. It was really great talk. Um, there are already questions coming. Um, uh, the first one is from uh, Nabi, uh, who says, great talk. Uh, I have one quick question. How do you normalize GFP and RFP um, intensities? Um, is it total mean in each frame uh, throughout the entire frames of the movie? Does it require photo bleaching correction? So for the single cell work, everything is normalized to that cell um, at the initial time point. And for the work on the hex cells, it is the uh, total fluorescent signal because um, these cells actually divide. Um, it does require photo bleaching correction, but that's a fairly straightforward um, uh, uh, thing to do. It, and so we don't, we don't actually see very much in terms of the effect of photo bleaching with these particular exposures. It's not very long exposure, but it does help. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have a question from the new uh, Milardi who says, great talk. Uh, it is known that uh, poly ubiquitin chains linked to lysine 63 may serve uh, as a sig uh, signaling to uh, autophagy. I uh, have you tried to measure poly ubiquitin chain levels in the system. No, that's a it's a great idea. We haven't necessarily looked at differential ubiquitination, which residues, and and um, actually trying to manipulate um, ubiquitination in the system. It's something that that um, we could do, and if if we had uh, interest, our our goal was primarily to look in an unbiased fashion for factors that enhance flux or reduce it. And so we, we haven't used it specifically for, uh, you know, to test uh, hypotheses such as those, but that, that's a great idea. Thank you. Um, there is one from an anonymous attendee. Uh, is your, uh, in your essay, how do you distinguish autophagy from other protein clearance mechanisms? Yeah, so when we're looking at LC3, we, um, uh, went on the assumption that the majority of turnover of LC3 is via autophagy, but we're able to prove that actually by going back and specifically blocking individual pathways like the proteasome or um, calpanes, for instance, um, or autophagy. And we can see that um, somewhere between 80 to 90% of the clearance of LC3 is via um, autophagy. Um, and there's a uh, a small proportion, about 10 to 20 percent, in uh, cells that is driven by the proteasome. It's a good, good question. Though. Yeah, thank you. Um, I there is a question from uh, Diego Popper um, for Sami. <laughs> Does the cytotoxic effect of autophagy induction occur in many cell types? Uh, do you think this also occurs in in vivo, or is it simply the effect of the amount of drugs used? So cells are are very uh, differentially vulnerable to the effects of of autophagy induction, right? So for for example, hex cells can can take huge doses, relatively high doses of things like rapamycin and torin, or even uh, baflomycin, and and not seem to show um, any anywhere, but uh, things like neurons, for instance, primary neurons are much more sensitive. So we get away with 10 micromolar 
in hex cells, but you have to drop it down to the nanomolar range in primary neurons. So it, it's probably a bit of both. Um, there is a cell type specific effect, but it, most people use these drugs at um, massively uh, overdosed levels. And, and I think they can drop it down quite a bit and reduce some of that toxicity. Yeah, thank you. So um, uh, I guess at this uh, point, what we were going to do, if anybody wants to, uh, we have more questions, um, just please raise your hands so we can let you in a panel for a uh, discussion. Uh, and the questions will be addressed uh, uh, both to um, uh, Sami and Celine. Um, so uh, while we are wait waiting for the hands question, uh, I have a question for you, Sami, uh, in regards to the, uh, the effect uh, on the, of the ubiquitin, one, of the ubiquitin 2 mutant on um, uh, like uh, when the autophagy was stimulated. Have you tried uh, to see uh, what will happen in case you uh, inhibit? Is it, is it the same effect or have you? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, the pro, um, uh, if autophagy induction is, is bad, uh, can we inhibit it? And, and I think it's a um, sort of a damned if you do and damned if you don't, because in general, in the primary neurons, if you in, inhibit autophagy, they don't do very well. Um, and, and so it's, it's a hard question to answer, at least in that system. I think um, in other systems, like Ber some of the experiments that Mervyn's done, um, I, I think you can get away with that strategy, but I'm not, I'm not sure if that's, um, you know, cause you're trying to treat, you have an impairment on autophagy and then you're trying to create a second, uh, impairment to make things better. You know, the two wrongs make a right yeah. and, and it doesn't always, it doesn't always work well in, in biology. <laughs> Yes, yes. So what you actually recommend, the personalized approach, you need to check what you well, have. And based yeah. on that, you just go ahead because you, you may be treating something which you make it worse. Uh, I think you need to know a little bit more about what you're treating before you before you go in. And, and But it matters more, I think, for these genetic conditions. We, we still know the large majority of people with sporadic disease. There's no mutation that we know of, and, and maybe there is, we just don't know it. But um, it, it could be very different in those sporadic people that that uh, um, sort of non-selective upregulation of autophagy is a little bit more helpful, but I we, we just don't know. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I, I have a question actually to Celine, uh, which is uh, a more um, uh, just I would like to hear your insights about alpha synuclein aggregation without lipids um, and. Uh, do you think it's like the chicken and the egg? Do you think it starts first in the membrane or like it starts in the cytoplasm, oligomer, like uh, oligomerizes, goes uh, into the membrane, comes back? So any, any thoughts on, on that? Um, but, I mean, that's an excellent uh, question. And I don't uh, think that we have the, the answer. So we, we know that if we trigger the, the aggregation of um, uh, alpha-synuclein, uh, without the membrane, that the oligomers that are found and the fibrils are toxic and, and they disrupt the uh, synthetic and the biological uh, membrane. Well, uh, the hypothesis that we are working on uh, at the moment is to is that the, the switch in lipid composition uh, uh, is the reason why the protein starts aggregation, uh, aggregating. But maybe there is a different process occurring uh, in parallel. In, in the cell, uh, aggregating at the surface of the membrane and, and in solution due to the binding to other toxic uh, species. And it might be a combination of the, of the two. Of, uh, so the, I, I don't think that anyone know, but it, it would be too, uh, um, maybe we might uh, miss something if we just focus on, on one aggregation pathway and we don't consider the other. I think it's a combination of, of all of them. And, and I'm also curious about, you mentioned uh, I, I, you showed the spectrum of it, but to, have you um, um, 
uh, are you thinking about having a high resolution structure of it? Uh, so you just, uh, I don't know whether this was my connection that uh, froze, but you, you're talking about the fibrils. Uh, I'm talking about the fibrils and the lipids binding to the fibrils. You 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 mentioned yes. that the lipids are incorporated mm. in, in, in it. Yes. Any insights uh, about that? Uh, um, yeah, I mean, this is an, a, an excellent question. It's on our uh, very long uh, to-do list to have an idea of the structure of the fibroids uh, from the presence of uh, lipid and see how they, they uh, I mean, the idea would be to see how the lipids are, are uh, arranged inside the, the, the fibroids. Yeah. Yeah. But that will actually be very good to know because we know that the, they are there and we know that the properties of the lipids are, are, are changed. So we, we see that they don't have the same uh, fluidity and, and uh, 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 dynamics inside the, the fibroids. So what we are missing now is uh, how they, they are um, uh, assembled, whether they just coat the surface of the fibroids or, or whether they are more uh, uh, included inside the core of the fibroids. Yeah, so so they stay in, in the mature fibroids, the lipids are permanently yes. incorporated. Yeah, yes. That's that's very interesting. Uh, I, I guess, uh, Rams, you have questions. Um, oh, great talk, Sammy and um, uh, Celine. Really enjoyed it very much. Thanks. I have several questions for Celine um, mm -hmm. uh, on this synuclein membrane interaction. So, um, do you have any data for um, the difference between monomer oligomer fiber affinity for membrane? And can you can you talk about that? Do they differ in the affinity? Uh, we don't have any data, but there is some uh, data showing that the, at least the oligomers are more toxic to the cells uh, than fibrils and, and monomer. This we haven't tested yet in the in the in our model. But you mentioned that oligomers form pores than monomers, so. so but this is based on published uh, data, but not on ours. Ah, work from uh, Kitty and Fabrizio Kitty and uh, Nino Cremades, they, they look into this in the SHSY fiber cells. So based on your data, can you summarize like this? So your, your synuclein is um, having stronger binding affinity for anionic membranes and thinner membrane. Um, there are two types of mechanism. One is fiber dependent and fiber independent, right? So like pore so, formation. So, non -pore formation. Uh, so, so, so the pore kind of formation. Summarize the whole yeah. So, so the, the so the pore formation is, uh, or at least from what what is uh, published, it, it looks like if you form fibrils uh, in the absence of a lipid, or if you form oligomers in the absence of lipid, they are able to make uh, or to permeabilize the membrane. Then the mechanism by which they permeabilize the membrane. I don't think this is uh, known. It might be by a force. But then in, uh, if we look at, I mean, what we did was to look at the aggregation on the surface of the membrane. So there it disrupt the membrane also by uh, incorporating uh, lipid inside the fibrils. So I don't think this is pore formation. It's more the, to extract the lipid from the, from the membrane. Yeah. So were you able to see the structural transition going Going from random coil to helix to beta sheet, is it? Uh... Uh, no, we couldn't do this uh, because the um, the the aggregation was in the presence of uh, we we had an excess of monomer at the end of the aggregation uh, experiment, so we we couldn't see the the the, the signal was too strong in the city of the unfolded uh, state. Yeah. So in your in your solid state number data that you showed for carbon thirteen of lipids. Mm -hmm. Is it static or MAS, CP mass, or just direct? Carbon? It's a solid, uh, solid state uh, mass. Uh, mass. It's a, uh, it's spin at the ma ma magic angle. Yes. So, is it cross polarization or direct carbon detection? Uh, we actually uh, did uh, three type of measurement. We we do we did uh, um, cross polarization, direct polarization, and uh, inept. Net, to look okay. at the um, uh, dynamic of the lipids in the pure uh, system and in the fibrids. And that's where we, we found that the dynamics were uh, affected. Uh, in the, they, they were not the same in the pure membrane and in the uh, fibrids. So can you tell us what exactly happened between inept and uh, let's say CP mass in the presence of 
upon it was, was less it was less uh, it was less dynamic uh, in the in the field the, the lipids were less dynamic in the field and we could actually also uh, uh, monitor the um, uh, the melting of the of the lipid inside the um, the fibrils, and it actually the melting temperature was much lower than in the pure membrane system. So it was approximately at twenty one degrees, the same melting temperature as when the uh, monomer is bound to the vesicle. So in your in the spectrum, the only spectrum that you showed, the lines are broader. Is that the message? Uh, yes, and we also observe the same for the phosphorus uh, uh, NMR. The lines so, were broader also. So you're interpreting the line burning as a um, uh, slow down the dynamics. Is that what you are saying? Or? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, but you have a uh, different types of population, right? You have lipid bilayer bound lipids, fiber bound lipids, and then maybe there are some free lipids as well. So maybe there's a heterogeneity mm -hmm. causing the line burning as opposed to the mobility because you already spinning fast enough to narrow down the line width. So. Uh, mm. Maybe your cross polarization efficiency is more time mobility mm. dependent, but then not the line width per se. Mm. Uh, that's what I'm thinking. I don't know. Maybe you. Yeah, I mean, we didn't look at this into a lot of uh, into much details. To be honest, we we yeah we we saw also a change in uh, anisotropy because we could actually uh, measure it, uh, and. Um, yeah, that was the main uh, the the main measurement that we that we did. Yeah. Just one last question. So, do you think yeah. the binding affinity with um, membrane could uh, vary with the concentration of synuclein? Um, that's one question. I have another one. You also mentioned you, in your slide you showed that your DMPE and cholesterol uh, composition. Do you have any data or any information on that lipid domain versus uh, membrane synuclein interaction. So for the for the domain, the the only I would say uh, experiment that we did that, that was close to answering this question was when we did the measurement with the uh, cholesterol, and and there we we, we could see the uh, similar affinity as uh, without cholesterol, and we couldn't see aggregation also in the presence of cholesterol. But we do, we didn't look systematically at uh, domain. But this this is a good point because uh, actually synuclein is proposed to bind. Um, preferentially at the at the interface in between the, the domain. Then regarding whether the binding uh, change with uh, alpha synuclein concentration, well, when, when we do the titration, we, 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 we add more and more uh, 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 lipid to, to a solution of alpha synuclein, and we get the same KD uh, for, for different uh, concentration of, uh, of alpha synuclein. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Magda, there's a question in the chat box, I think. Uh, also, ah, yes. Lisa, can you please, uh, you, you can ask your question, then I'll follow up with the... Uh... Go ahead, go ahead, ask Hi. the question. Um, Celine, I wanted to follow up a little bit more on my question about the function of synuclein. And I know this is yes. very speculative and I'm asking you to speculate, but um, I'm really interested in the changes uh, in the lipid architecture of my membranes by GKs and how that might in, impact the function of synuclein as well as its, its misfolding, which is what you, you're studying. And of course the misfolding obviously is pulling synuclein out of the membrane. And in addition, changing the membrane characteristics. Uh, and and there, there are, there are uh, in a number of people who feel very strongly that synuclein function is related to its binding to membranes and changing of curvature and, and how that would impact synaptic um, vesicle formation and function. So I, I know this is not your um, wheelhouse, but I'm, I'm curious about what your thoughts have been about, um, about the impact there. Well, so what we know is that uh, the, the content, the lipid content, or actually I think the, the glucose, uh, the, the glucose ceramid content of uh, in the membrane uh, affects the morphology of the membrane. So it forms some tubes when the ratio, when the okay. glucose ceramid level is too, too, too high. That's something that uh, Joe Mazzulli have, uh, have shown. So then this will uh, likely uh, affect the, the binding of alpha synuclein to membrane and 
and its potential uh, function. So, so probably indirectly, we have these uh, changes in lipid uh, composition. GCA is, uh, is, is probably going to affect uh, the alpha synuclein uh, function. Then whether it also involves protein-protein interaction, this is not known. And that's something that we are looking into uh, at the moment. Yeah. That's very interesting. I hadn't thought of that aspect. I'll look forward to what you do on it. So we have one question in, in the chat um, from James. Let's see if I can let James in um, to ask the question. Hi, James, do you mind asking your question? Uh, not at all. Um, this is for Celine. Um, so um, there are two lipids uh, or classes of lipids that um, um, don't really require a presentation in, uh, in the form of membranes. One would be glucosal sphingosine uh, and for type three Gaucher disease, uh, glucosal sphingosine levels can be quite high. The other would be uh, phospholipids that become oxidized and, and become truncated and form aldehydes or carboxylic acids and would move into an aqueous phase. So have you looked at either of those uh, groups of lipids in terms of aggregation uh, and, and what, what have you found? Yes, so this is a, an excellent question and this is something that we are uh, looking uh, into. We, we are looking at, we, we, we did some in vitro uh, aggregation experiment with uh, uh, glucosyl ceramide, and we are now uh, doing more with uh, glucosyl sphingosine and uh, oxidized uh, lipid. Actually, we, we, we are working on um, uh, inducing uh, oxidative stress in uh, dopaminergic uh, neuron and uh, extract the lipids from those neurons and see how oxidative stress affects the chain of those uh, lipids and then uh, um, use them uh, in uh, our biophysical uh, assay. But th that's an excellent uh, point. So this is something that we are uh, looking into. Yeah. yeah and, and just as a follow-up, um, you know, this general question about whether um, in Gaucher disease, uh, aggregation is due to accumulating lipid versus misfolded um, glucose rebrosidase. Uh, couldn't that be answered by um, uh, just um, eliminating or knocking down the activator protein saposin C, in which case you get a Gaucher type phenotype with increased lipids, but uh, you shouldn't have any misfolding of the uh, alpha, of the glucose rebusitis. But, but, but this would lead to the uh, accumulation of uh, lipids, wouldn't it? It would, but but if the um, if the unanswered question is whether the misfolded alpha, uh, beta glucose rebusidase itself okay. yeah. is inducing the um, mis the aggregation of the, the alpha yes. synuclein, wouldn't that distinguish mm -hmm. those two possibilities? Yeah, I mean that's a very good uh, suggestion. So then you would actually alter the lipid profile uh, using saposin C and not GCA. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a good suggestion. That's something that we didn't uh, uh, thought about, but we can try to see whether we can model that in our, uh, in our model, yeah, in our, uh, maybe at least first in the SHS55 assays. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. 